Hello, I'm Naman Abuja. I'm Associate Professor of Art and Aesthetics at JNU, and I'm here today on behalf of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Simla and on behalf of Sahapedia to conduct an interview with my grandmother, Shanu Khurana. Um, Shanu Khurana is the doyen of the Rampur Sahas Fan Kharana and has been broadcasting on All India Radio since 1945. <laughs> And um, uh, she's been awarded the Padma Bhushan, the Padma Shri, the Sangeet Natak Academy Award, the Fellowship of the Sangeet Natak Academy. Um, she's recorded her music in India and all over the world. She's given major concerts. She's a musicologist. She has published widely in the field of Indian classical music as well as in the field of Indian folk music. My um, interviews with her are going to try and traverse her journey and the wider social context of her journey. How has the music scene in India changed over the past how many years of your career? When oh. did you start, learn, start learning music? Learning music, classical music from the age of 12. Hmm. And, but earlier, I mean, I was singing, uh, I hadn't discovered myself because I used to pick up any song. But classical music from the age of 12. 12, so that makes it 27, 28, 29, 1939, your formal education in classical music began. Yeah. And who was that under? This was Professor Raghunath Rao Musilgaonkar, hmm. or the Gwalior Karana. He was the nephew of uh, Raya Bhaiya Pusha, the daughter of Gwalior Karana. I was initiated into music by Raghunath Ramosil Gangarji. And where was that? That was in? Jodhpur. And um, what was he doing in Jodhpur? He was looking around, he wanted to settle down. Hmm. He wanted to come away from Gwalior. Hmm. He happened to come to Jodhpur and he wanted to make a career there because uh, though uh, classical music has always been there in the bars, Jodhpur Maharaja had uh, uh, quite a, a few gurus in Ustad and uh, not that he was because he wanted to join the Darbar but he just wanted to be there and start his career. And um, did he was there a music scene in Jodhpur at that time, in the 30s? All these states, they vied with each other to have the great gurus and ustads in the courts. But, uh, I mean, as you know, in those days, uh, uh, especially girls were uh, not exposed to this kind of music. I mean, there was no question of their going to their bars. Uh, and I had led from a very protected life. So there was music, it's not that it wasn't there, but not so much outside uh, the Dagas. So how did you get exposed to classical music? What I, made you want to learn it? I don't know. I, I think I... It just happened. It just happened... Uh, I was singing, picking up old songs, favorite songs, everything. And I must have been around eight or nine when I I listened to Pandit Narayan Ravyas or the Gwalya Karana, who had learned from uh, uh, Vishnu Digambar himself. And um, I was drawn towards it. I didn't know what classical music was, hmm. but uh, I was attracted by it. I, I like the, the, that music, the tongues, the alap, and I aspired, I wanted to know, I wanted to learn. But at that time when I heard him, there was no, there was no atmosphere, I mean, there was no environment for me to learn. It happened only at the age of 12, 12 and a half. And so, how did you hear the music of Narayan Ravyas? Radio. Radio was a very, on India radio was very really powerful. 
And uh, for that matter, one only spent all the, the classical music which has been propagated over the years. It's so very, very speaking. Mm. And uh, as you know, most of the well-known artists, whether vocalists or uh, instrumentalists, they were brought up by the radio. They got more, more exposure. So who were the artists that you were really listening to at that time? Whose broadcasts were you looking forward to listening? Well, uh, Narayan Rogas was one. And then, Musil um, Gaukaji said that I should hear Roshinara Begum. Mm -hmm. You know, Roshinara Begum, I've yet to hear a woman musician who's as good as her. I mean, that's the way I think. Mm -hmm. uh, voice, voice production, her tones, uh, the way she the way she brought the, a rag and gave its personality. It was a kind of performance that I looked forward to, which had this uh, a very systematic work. And then the dance, the voice, the way she trained her voice, that really, really attracted me. And as a, as a girl, I, I just wanted to copy her. Mm -hmm. That was the time. And now, Roshanara came from the Kirana Karana. That's right. Narayanra Vyas and Musal Gaukar were from Gwalior. From Gwalior. Yeah. So, as your teacher, did Musal Gankar have a problem with your trying to being so influenced by Roshanara? No, in fact he told me, you must hear her more often. Okay. And I used to make it a point, and she, in those days, uh, if an artist has a, had a, a duration performance, a duration of one hour, mm -hmm. it was something very great that mm -hmm. the person must be very great. Mm -hmm. And now of course we all do it ourselves, mm -hmm. but uh, at that time, 10 to 11 at night, from Bombay, mm -hmm. she used to broadcast, and I used to listen, listen, listen to her. And um, I remember that I, I used to be, you know, my father used to shout at me, for heaven's sake, now switch off the radio, for to go to school tomorrow, mm -hmm. or that kind of thing, but I just wanted to hear her. I was very influenced by her music for a long, long time. I've always admired her. And so when it came to the kind of ragdhati that Musil Gankar himself was teaching, um, you know, Raja Bhunya Puchwale's tradition of music is a slightly different version of Gwalior to what we heard from, let's say, the Pandit families, mm. Lakhanda, uh, Krishna Rao Shankar Pandit's mm -hmm. family yeah. of Gwalior. Uh, or it is a different version of Gwalior to, you know, we, because Gwalior spread so widely in Maharashtra yeah. at that time. You don't forget Gwalior Karana, the fountain head of all Karanas. So what was the quality, what was the kind of thing that he was laying emphasis on? What did he want you to pick up? Musilgaon mm. Uh the, the correct, the personality of the dark, mm. technically, mm. And uh, the way a rag is developed, how it's divided into eight portions, mm -hmm. Ashtam, Gayaki. But he was, uh, one great thing about Musil Gaukaji was that it was, wasn't only uh, just the vocal part. Mm -hmm. He wanted to wanted me to analyze the rag for myself, understand for myself how to go about that, how to give emphasis on certain looks, and uh, how to use my voice in dance. And he wanted me to grow. Mm -hmm. He guided me, of course, he was teaching me all the time, but he gave me enough lenient, he was very lenient, come on, now you develop it yourself. These are the notes and you do it. Mm -hmm. And he also introduced me to these books of Bhatkhandi. Mm -hmm. He believed in that. Right. It wasn't only oral tradition. Right. So he said, you better read this, understand this, see how the notation comes. 
-hmm. And he also taught me how to uh, uh, talk about aesthetics, how to talk about the, 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 the importance of uh, uh, different thoughts from where the rags come. So he was very systematic that way. And how did he learn all this? Did he ever share that with you? He never shared that with me, but uh, he was very involved. Did you ever hear him give a full performance? Yes, I did. And his first broadcast was from Delhi. Uh, and that was for one hour. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a morning session. And uh, he sang Rag Todi. And, uh, when was that? Oh, that must have been uh, late forties. Late forties. Mm. And by mid that time, you mid, 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 forties. mid forties. Mid forties. You had moved to Delhi by then. No, I was still in Jodhpur. You were still in Jodhpur. No, I was still in Jodhpur. So it means just before you got married. That's right. That's just before that. I see. So it must have been a big thing. He went to Delhi for his broadcast. Yes, yeah, he went came all the way to Delhi. Mm -hmm. Broadcast. And um, so in his performance, he sang Todi for one hour. Hmm. Now, when he was training you, would he make you um, perform in front of him for an hour at a stretch or two hours or what was his way of teaching? What did he do? No. He, uh, he introduced me to the, to the rock, mm -hmm. then Bharat, mm -hmm. and I repeated after him mm -hmm. as the way to, the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then the dance. Yeah. So, uh, but to develop it into a harmonious, complete item, a complete piece of music. He was still working on me when I got married. Right. <laughs> and uh, probably he didn't know that I was sleep away then. That early? That early. How old were you? I was just about 18. Were you really 18? <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and so you married and you went to, you left Jodhpur huh? and from there I went to Ambala where my husband was posted. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in Ambala just for about three months or so. I see. Then my husband got posted to Lahore mm -hmm. and it was in Lahore that uh, uh, it just happened. Uh, there was a music festival going on there and someone said you would like you to perform. Hmm. I was very thrilled. I wasn't afraid at all. I don't know how or not. But uh, I sang there and the audience was Pandit Jivanlal Mattu who was a he, who was with All India Radio, who was a producer there, but had learned from Vahid Khasa of Kirana Karana. Okay. He, Vahid Khasa. Mm -hmm. he heard me in this uh, festival. And uh, so after the program finished, he came and he blessed me and he said, Bitta Radio pe gaungi hai. I said, Haan gaungi. So he said, Oh, I'll come and see me on such and such day. And uh, so I went there. Uh, I signed a contract of 30 rupees, those were the fees in those days and I was very thrilled, wasn't afraid at all, how? I don't know how I was not afraid, <laughs> but uh, after I finished my evening broadcast, which was around about 5.30 or 6, I had sung Raj Muntani. That's the time when you sing mm -hmm. in And so I went to the duty room. Mm -hmm. He was sitting there. I said, Ji, Pandit Ji, how did I sing? So he said, Ji, how did I sing? You know that the Raad Tori and Raad Murtani is how the Raad is like? How does it feel? How would I know at the age of 18 the, the nuances, the, the bariki as we call it, 
that each rag, in spite of it's so many rags, in spite of having flat and sharp nose, but flat to what extent? Sharp to what extent? Mm -hmm. Because in the book you can't make out. Mm -hmm. It's just flat and sharp. Mm -hmm. But it's the old tradition which teaches you mm -hmm. how to use a particular nose so as to highlight the rag. Right, to get the correct format. Correct format mm -hmm. and to get the correct rasa. Right. Now, uh, having a flat gandhar of Murtani and a flat gandhar of Tori, Tori is a morning ra, Murtani is an evening ra. Mm -hmm. And how you differentiate, how you lay different emphasis on different notes, and that becomes evening and that becomes morning. Ra. So, when he gave a comment like that to you, mm -hmm. did you take it as a criticism? I started thinking. Right. I started thinking, but I didn't know any better. Huh. I, I still, I didn't know any better. And then what made you learn, want to make it better? How did I, you make it better? I wanted to discover myself. Hmm. Until then I didn't know that music was going to become it's a passion, obsession. And when did I become a professional? I, I, mm. No, I didn't know. Mm. I didn't know. And, uh, but I started, uh, but once I started broadcasting, mm. there was something to look forward to. Mm. And I, I worked very hard towards it. Mm. I didn't uh, wait for any results, but I just wanted to do it. Mm. And uh, we lived in the cantonment area. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to have a tabla and I had to come and so that I could do my practice. Mm. A tabla master, Tufail Mia, mm. who was with Lahore radio station, mm. used to travel all the way from Lahore to Walton by train mm -hmm. once a week mm. and come for my practice. And I did it. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. But till then I didn't know how serious I would <laughs> And how often would you go to the radio station there to broadcast? Uh, I don't remember correctly, but uh, sometimes twice a month. I see. Hmm. Sometimes once a month. And so each time the broadcasts would be three broadcasts like they have them these days? Morning, evening? What I remember was morning and evening. And you wouldn't believe it, in the whole winter, uh, at that time, we didn't have a car of our own. We were in, being in the Air Force. There was a big truck which used to come early in the morning for me. Mm. And I had to sit in the truck. Right. And I put on my gloves. Mm. Especially, it was so cool. So cool. Mm. So I reached there early morning at 6.30. I see. To be able to do a performance at 8 or something like that. Then come back. Then go again in the evening. And, um, and of course in those days it was all live performances. All live performances. There was no recording at all. Recording is very recent. So it was a passion. So to tell me, I used to come for your practice. Yeah, he used to come for my practice. And also, I had the opportunity in in the Air Force Station. Hmm. Uh, musicians used to be, used to be invited right. to play for the officers and men. Hmm. And I, I remember. Uh, um, Musicians from Patiala hmm. came. Like uh, I, if I remember the uh, correctly, uh, Abdul Aziz Khan. Hmm. He came with his veena, with hmm. veena, hmm. and I heard his. Uh, we were all there, so it was exposure uh, of classical music in Lahore. Hmm. Also, uh, that. Uh, maybe influenced me. But don't you think in a way, being a woman, mm. from your social background, you were really lucky, not unlucky, but really lucky because you were able to pursue this career. You, perhaps because it was, had you one of your brothers, could never have thought of becoming a professional musician. Mm. 
It would never have happened. Never, because I mean, perhaps yeah. because there were no expectations of you to have a career. Yeah. Yes, you are very true. <laughs> because in the olden days, we used to have a music teacher coming to the house hmm. in Jodhpur, teaching my sisters, hmm. and uh, I, I, I just to sit and watch. And uh, then I suddenly, uh, one day, I'm told that I bolted myself from inside. And uh, because you know the old railway houses, you the long bolts. Hmm. I stood up on a stool and I bolted myself. And I uh, started playing on the harmonium, the same song that my sisters were learning. Uh, no one had taught me. So, uh, so the teacher used to come just to teach them, to keep them busy, but so that you know the girls know how to study, they know how to be interested in music or whatever or whatever. I just watched and learned, and it just came. It just came. It must have been very difficult for a woman, on the one hand to get into music. On the other hand, because you were a woman, you were being able to get into music. I mean, if you had been one of your, like your brothers, they would not have been able to have the opportunities you did to become musicians. You know, I uh, didn't know, as I said earlier, I hadn't discovered myself. It was passion for me, obsession. I wanted to learn music. I was so involved in it. I didn't know whether I was going to take it up as a profession because uh, uh, my husband was in the Air Force and he gets posted here and there what was facilities I would have. You know, it was, but I just wanted to sing. Mm. And, uh, uh, and I got full support from him. Full support from him. It was only later on when during partition time when we decided to come and settle down in Delhi mm. and my husband got into private practice as a doctor, as a dental surgeon mm. that um, luckily the All India Radio people approached me here mm. in Delhi and said we would like you to broadcast mm -hmm. and so I started broadcasting again um, after Lahore I started broadcasting here and now, when you were here in Delhi and you were broadcasting here, sorry to interrupt you, but I, your repertoire of what you were singing mm. was still the things that Mosul Gaonkar had taught you. Yes, yes. So it must have been, even though your period of training under him mm. initially yeah. had been what, six, seven years? About six years. Oh. It must have been very substantial because in six years he gave you enough to be able to start a career on? Yes, I, um, the foundation was laid, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and as I said, the Gwalia Gharana is a is a, the oldest Gharana that we have. Uh, so much so that uh, uh, even in Bhatkhande, you find so many Bhadishis of different Gharanas in in Bhatkhande parts. Mm -hmm. And I was also learning from Bhatkhande's books. Mm -hmm. Gaudiji was teaching me from Mark Kandy's uh, books also. Right. So I had that grounding also. Right. Uh, and then you were saying that you kept meeting other musicians in Lahore and places and picking up from them. Picking up from them. Hira Bhai Baroka was in Lahore. Right. The Shruti Gumbar had started a school there. Right. And Hira Bhai Baroka came to see. So I was very influenced uh, by Hira Bhai. But at that time, uh, Hira Bhai Baroka, Roshi Nara Begum, amongst the women singers, hmm. the very well known uh, uh, musicians we had at that time, and I was influenced by them. And all three systems were something that you have in your, right, right from the beginning, I imbibed see. and used. Yeah, very fortunate. I was very fortunate having all oral tradition, plus the books. I, was ex I had exposure to all these forms. Right. And I, I met, I heard musicians from different Gharanas. Hmm. And, uh, and they chose me. But the foundations of voice culture yeah. and voice production yeah, yeah. was did you change your system and style of voice production at that time as you grew older, or do you feel that your voice, fundamental voice cultivation, has been achieved right at the beginning by Musal Dawa? I think so. I think so because he always wanted me to sing with an open voice mm -hmm. and uh, the real voice, the true voice. But as you grow older, you get mature and 
then when you start thinking about so many other things, the, 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 the literary aspect of the composition, the, the personality of the composition, where to bring the nine dressers in, in, in your voice, mellowness, virta or whatever. And so you keep finding for yourself, you keep experimenting and of course it's the environment that you you're surrounded by uh, also makes an impact on your way of voice production. You know, if it is uh, sometimes very, very sugary, then what happens that the technical aspect of Iraq is lost. So I have always believed keeping a balance of the technicalities of Iraq, of classicism and mm. aesthetics, mitas, mm. so as to give a full uh, impact to the listener and to your horse, yourself also mm. because uh, you're giving a shape to that rug mm. in your own way but the foundation is there so who um, at what stage in your career in the 40s when you were already in delhi and you by that time started broadcasting mm. again yeah. in delhi what made you want to go to other gurus and develop it further and... I... There's always thirst to learn, that's one thing. And since we were finally settled in one place, hmm. and so, I said, here's an opportunity for me uh, to... And I had more opportunity to learn to so many musicians in Delhi. Mm -hmm. um, so I kept my ears open, I kept my eyes open, and uh, I had exposure, again, okay, it was through All India Radio, exposure to different Daikis. Mm -hmm. And um, now this was a time when you were in Delhi that you had also taken on a job, is that right? Yes, we had uh, just come to Delhi and uh, I, uh, I, was, I was so worried that I might have to give up my music, which I didn't want to. And Why the worry? Hmm? Why were you worried about such a thing? I just wanted to, I just wanted to be in it. No, no, but what made you worry that you would have to give up your music? I thought, you know, it is a very difficult uh, to make a mark in your field. Especially when you are, you do not belong to a musician family. It's not easily that you're accepted by the Gharanadar people. Mm -hmm. So that thing I wanted, I wanted my, uh, uh, I want to make, I wanted to make a very firm footing in the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just went on working hard. So a shift began to happen. You became uh, clear that this was going to be a profession. Yeah. And it you just, became, I don't want to say it in a bad way, but like a sort of, like the way a professional is ambitious about their yeah, profession, yeah, yeah, you yeah. became a professional. Yeah, you, yeah. A shift took place. Yeah, yeah. And so when I was, so, this offer came to me. What offer? A, a teaching in Sanjeev Bharti. I see. It is, we just happened to go and call on Dr. Joshi who is a very well known surgeon of uh, Delhi mm. and uh, so my husband went to call on him mm. because he's going to start his practice. Mm. So he introduced me to his daughter Nirmala Joshi mm. who later on became the first year person of Sanjeev Natak Academy. I see. Mm. So, so she asked me about my interest and I said music. So she said that sounds wonderful. Would you like to uh, give us some time of this opened a school, Sangeet Bharti, mm. which is uh, in Connaught Circus. Mm. And even if you come twice a week, mm. very, we appreciate very much mm. that you come and teach there because you taking up a job like this, 
and you are so involved in it. We want women from families other than musician family hmm. to take up music as a profession. So this was a proper, this was a move. People wanted to get music to be taken on by other people than other than just musicians' Music families. Family. Yeah. Same thing happened at that time uh, when uh, Achim Maharaj the great hmm. Kathak exponent, hmm. he was teaching there. Mm -hmm. Kathak, he was teaching Kathak. Then there was Bharat Natyam there in the Sangeet Bharti. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of us, uh, whoever, Sundari Shridharani, mm. who used to be with Uday Shankar mm. at that time, she was teaching modern dancing. Mm -hmm. Kapila Vasanji was learning Kathak mm -hmm. and Bharatnatyam also. Mm -hmm. I was teaching uh, vocal music. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a direct moment. And I felt good that I found my peace in a way. Mm. And I kept working towards it. And then I, so any opportunity that came my way, I just... So this must have made you feel, uh, I mean this decision to work, it, how much were you being paid? I was paid 75 rupees, twice a week. So it was a significant contribution in the sense that, I mean from earning 30 rupees, yeah at Lahore, yeah. to jump up to 75. 75. It was the money part. My Why I agreed to this was that this way I'll be able to carry on with my music. Yeah, I know you're saying that, I know, but I'm mean, just saying that these are encouraging things encouraging, in anyone's yeah, career. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, and I mean, Post-partition times yeah. mustn't have been very easy. No, it was very difficult. Very difficult time, financially as well as otherwise. Because yeah. we had about 40 people staying with us at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was looking after the house, my children, everything I just did. But I never gave up music. I used to find some corner in the house so that I could do my riyas. Because at that time my husband told me, if you give up your music now, you had it. Mm -hmm. It was very trying time. And this, that is a time which taught me how to discipline myself, how to, how to have determination. So one thing led to another, that determination, that willpower, and, and, and the various circumstances, partition time, hmm. taught me how to keep a balance, you know. And all the circumstances, I feel, the environment, gives you a personality which also affects your voice, mm -hmm. your voice production. Mm -hmm. It's how to be tender, mm -hmm. where to use force, mm -hmm. all this very thing because I feel classical music has really taught me, has given me a kind of character or whatever you can call it. To live life. To live life. So there's no distinction between profession and personal mm. growth. Professional mm. growth and personal growth is mm. all holistic. Mm. Tell me, so then what happened? You, when did you seek more gurus? Yaku Jaydev Singh Ji, you know, the great musicologist, asked, uh, we are a Thaudi of the Agra Karana, mm -hmm. to teach you I see. some compositions of Agra Karana. I see. And also that Gaiki. Right. He wanted me to be exposed to all the Gaikis. And then when I was doing the exams, there were some ragas which not many people knew. Apachilit Raga. So Tavisa wanted me to go to Karagar, the, the only music university in northern India, mm -hmm. where Dr. Ratan Jankar was the vice chancellor. Mm -hmm. And um, I, so uh, I went to learn from him, I went to Canada all the way. Mm. And I had uh, talked to him for about three to four hours every day. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to talk me some real drama, which were not. I mean, Ratan Jantra was also Agra Karana. Agra Karana. He learned from Pai Asa Khansa. Mm. So I had exposure to that also, I learned that also. Then Mushtaq Hussain Khansa. Mushtaq Hussain Khansa was. Uh, uh, Rampur Gharana mm -hmm. 
and of course, as you know, Rampur Karana is an offshoot of Gwalior Karana. Mm -hmm. So that way, little differences here and there, but the foundation was the same. Was the same. Now, Tony, now when you were learning from Arthur, mm. what was he focusing on? What did he teach you? Rhythmic patterns. The different rhythmic patterns that you have in Agra Karana. I see. There are a lot of, I mean, if you heard any of these, are uh, Yunus Hussain Khan, or if you heard uh, uh, Fayyaz Khan sir, mm -hmm. all these people, the Vidaya Hussain Khan sir, all these people, there's a lot of rhythm. Because Agra Karana is based on Dhrupad Gaiki. Right. And in Dhrupad you have? A lot of movement. Right? Movement. Mm -hmm. And because, like uh, in Karana Karana, they don't have uh, uh, different rhythms. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you listen to someone like Roshana Rabegum, yeah, and you know she doesn't have. I mean, she is. I, I see what you mean about not being that much variety in the types of breakup. Breakup, yeah, because each karana has its own speciality, mm -hmm. own way of treating a rag. Mm -hmm. Own, like in, in Agra karana, they devote a lot of time on the. Or alap chari in the beginning, sure. and the whole the personality of a rag is exposed, mm. and then you take on the bandish, mm. and then you do uh, alap, and alap has been done basically earlier, and then the different different tan, dogan, mm. chogan, koar, this, that, and the other, it just goes on, mm. and that makes the performance very lively. Mm. While kirana is slowly and steadily each note. Hmm. Well, some Garanas feel it's always not the correct thing. Hmm. Like Khansa used to say, Mushtafus and Khansa used to say, there are some rags hmm. which need to be exposed straight away. The personality comes through straight away. Hmm. You strike those four or five notes and you know this is the rag. But if you would do one by one, hmm. one by, sometimes the personality is lost. That's what he used to say. Right. Like in Bhopali or like in Deshkar, mm -hmm. if you go Sare Gur and you bar bar Abdullah ke rukte ho, that makes it Bhopali. And if same notes, if you go and emphasize on Dhaiwal, that becomes Deshkar. Right. But if you are doing Bharat by one note by one, so kya fark lagega? Kul fark nahi lagega. This was what Khasa used to say. Mm. So each, so at Havriji, uh, Exposed to the different rhythmic patterns, and of course, to the beautiful bandishes of Agra Karana. Mm. They have a large collection of bandishes. Right. Large collection. And so, and Ratan Jankar, what did he teach you? He taught me ragas like, uh, which I generally not heard, Gauri Ke Prakar, I see. Bilawal Ke Prakar, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, Nike, uh, Canada ke prakar. I see. And so we went that direction. I see. And so I had a from East Karana. And then when you finally fell into Mustafa Hussain Khan Sahib's hands, mm. did he feel that maybe paka pakaya mal mil gaya ready voice, mm. or did he feel that no, this is this person is not okay? Oh my God, he made me feel as though I knew nothing. He, we sat and it just, I chai piya, thika, paan mangbai, thika, acha, inshallah, kar And I cried, I said, what am I? Where is Shalom Kurana? Because I'm neither here nor there. He just won't teach me. He sat for one hour, two hours. But he'd said the other, a few days earlier, he would have said to, um, Thakur sir, that your daughter is our daughter. You told me that you told me that Thakur sir will tell us. Why did you tell me that? They came to the house and they were sitting. And he loved singing himself also. Hmm. You know, we used to have the surgery, my husband's surgery. And, uh, and he used to say, the doctors are sitting here. They are listening here. They are listening here. They are listening here. Because he was a court lover here. Right. So he loves you know, singing for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then later on, uh, 
once or twice when he somehow liked what I was singing. Hmm. So he said, Beta, Abhi. How Abhi. much time was that? It was more than three months. And he used to come often during the three months? How often? Like once or twice a week? Once, once a week he used to come. Hmm. And uh, then just... I just Meanwhile, just, your career was still going I was, on. I was still... You, I was by that stage, you'd been broadcasting for yeah. about 14, 15 years? Yeah, yeah, hmm? yeah, I was. I was, I was. And uh, then somehow he, he felt that I was capable of taking on to the Gharana Gayaki and then Tatu Sakim and then I became a But Gharana. for those three months, yeah. he didn't teach you anything? No, he didn't teach me anything. I used to be literally in tears because I thought I left, I'd lost my personality completely. I didn't know where I was. But why, why was he was doing it to me? But did you not realize that he's testing you? Later on I realized, not then. Earlier I was very eager to learn. I wanted to learn, I wanted more and more. But I didn't realize that he was testing me. It was only after testing me that he said, No, beta, ab lo. Ye hira jo arab jo paye hai, jo uthana chaati ho, utha lo. It was then. Those were his words. These were his words. And there was no looking back after that. Thakur Sahib came all the way from Badars again. We had the Ganda ceremony. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, he, he taught me Drupad, he taught me Dhamar, he taught me Khayal, he taught me Tappa, he taught me Thumri, he taught me Sos also of uh, Rampur Karana, of Shia people. Mm -hmm. Thakur Sahib wanted me to learn that also. So one day he but asked me. These are very rare things to learn souls and yes. things. I mean, nobody says souls anymore. Yeah, no, nobody said. And then uh, um, one day he was teaching me Nike Canada hmm. and he suddenly stopped me. He said, Ghazal Gati ho? Kyu ni Gati ho? So I said, I'm chote te. So Pita Ji said that there was no reason for that. Why? It was the truth of love. He said, I know what. So he looked at me and he said, Maa sir, it can't be from God. Look, if you understand one thing, you are a professional girl. So this is a joke for us. It is a joke for us. There is everything in it. जो बदमा सोस टप्पा जो कुछ भी है और अगर आपकी फरमाइश हो गई कि चलो जी ये गजल सुनाइए तो आपके मुंह से ये ना निकले कि मुझे आता नहीं आता नहीं आना आपको सब चाहिए कि आपकी मर्जी है कि अगर आप पब्लिक में उसे गाना चाहते हैं या नहीं गाना चाहते वो आपकी मर्जी है लेकिन जी आपके मुंह से ना निकले कि क्या but then I realized hmm. that how well you have to be equipped. Hmm. It's just not that you have to learn the 10th year. You have to be sitting in the morning, you have to be in the No, that's not the thing. Hmm. You have to be equipped with all these things. You, it's lifetime which is not enough to master all this. Was there anything in the way that you used to sing that he did not approve of? No, he never said that. But did you realize something in your own self that maybe I can be doing this better in the way that he is teaching me? Or did you realize any mistakes that you had been making? He didn't point out any mistakes, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. And this is what Achha. He would say, mm -hmm. Ab ye hai, isko, isko aise So now tell me, this is what I want to know. For someone who had learned from Musal Gamkar, Athaple, Ratan Jankar, had been listening to different musicians, had been looking at the textbooks, etc. Now, when you would learn a particular thing from him, would you? Did you try and um, repeat any of the rags that you had already learned or were you trying to learn only new things from 
you start the sentence. No, no, whatever you wanted me to say, I just learned that. And he was perfectly aware of the fact that you had been trained in Gwalior, Agra, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah. And he was happy about that. Yeah, he was happy. Because even in those days, he himself had learned from his mama Puttan Khan hmm. of Jaipu uh, Gharana, Bindi Bazaar Gharana, hmm. was exposed to different writers. Yes, Khayal Gaiki made a different yeah. writer. At this time, when you were writing this book, um, you were his student at that time? Uh, no. When uh, Athagaji suggested that I work on this, mm -hmm. and Thakur Sab said it was a good idea, mm -hmm. then... You started your research on this? I started my research on this, mm -hmm. and I went to different Gharanagar people. I visited them, mm -hmm. I worked on, uh, on my research, and in this I've taken nine Gharanas. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I've taken Delhi Gharana, I've taken Agra Gharana, I've taken Gwalior Gharana, I've taken Patiala Gharana, I've taken Bandi Bazar, I've taken uh, Rampur, so and uh, um, Jaipur Gharana, Patrodi Jaipur Gharana. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I've been going to all these streets, gullies of Delhi, Sonimala. Delhi Gharane Gli, Chan Khan Sahib Ke Paas, Malik Arjun Mansur Ji Ke Paas. I went to all these musicians mm. and I sat and worked with, and, them. with them. And they were kind enough mm. to give me some compositions. And because you were a practicing musician, yeah. you were able to pick up the nuances of what they were trying to communicate. Yes, yes. And, then, and the biggest, uh, I think, uh, uh, the opportunities that I got because of Thakur Sahib, because they all respected Thakur Sahib so much, mm. that no one wanted to say no to me. Mm. And they also saw that he is a serious worker mm. who would do to take up this guy. So that's why I've got bandishes of all these gharanas in my book. Now, this business of exposing yourself to so many gharanas, did you try and assimilate different things into your own music? It's a natural thing. The foundation is Rampur Gaudiya Gharana. Mm. But if I've been influenced by Roshanara, mm. certain tan patterns, I'm influenced. And no one can deny that. No one can deny. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. Mm. In today's age, where in your ears you have voices, music, or different gharanas. Mm -hmm. It's not like the olden days that you went and lived with your guru for 20 years and 15 years and you heard no other voice than your gurus. Mm -hmm. Now, today, it's not possible. It's not possible. And of course, you grow as an individual, as a musician yourself. Yeah, no, what I'm trying to understand is that it was already not possible to have that in the 1930s and 40s. It was already an environment where you were getting to hear so many different things. Mm -hmm. And your gurus themselves were people who had been products of so many different so gharanas many, themselves. Yeah. And yet they were considered the stalwarts of one style, one even style. though they themselves were people who had learned from many different many styles. Different. Because they also believe that you, you have to be exposed to different gharanas. Mm -hmm. And then take in what you can assimilate in your own gharana. We are all, I mean after all, the seven notes or twelve notes, whatever. How you use those notes well in which rag, that is another thing. This is how we all grow. So when you were saying that Mushtaq Hussain taught you that, you know, your jholi must contain all different types mm. of mm. music, mm. all different types yes. of all forms. Yeah. Do you think that learning different forms in what way has the learning of different forms improved or enhanced or strengthened your control in classical music? Like for instance, take the tapafa. Hmm. The intricate tans that you have in tapafa. Hmm. 
you can bring them into your khayal also. We also have tap khayals. Mm -hmm. So, all these forms, like Dhrupad An, mm -hmm. in Andhra Dharada, mm -hmm. the, the variation in Tals, mm -hmm. rhythm, different rhythms, the Sargams of Bindi Bazaar, mm -hmm. Amman Ali Khaza. Mm -hmm. So, Sargams, in some Gharanas, Sargam was taught only when you wanted, wanted to teach a rag. Yeah. In teaching. Teaching, teaching. Not for performance. Not for performance. Mm -hmm. Khan Sahib himself never used to take Sargam. Mm -hmm. But his sons did. And I asked him once, I said, Khan Sahib, how is that? He said, Bhai, dekho. Sangeet kya? Dil ko khush karna. Agar aap ke saamne chaar loog bethi hoi hai, to sargam pasand karte hai. To kya harja aap ne bhi do cha sargam kya hai jo. You must know how to please others also. Because it's just not technique all the time. You're sitting in a bathak, in a mehfil or something. And some people like, hey, thua sa de do, koi harja nahi hai. He was very open, he had an open mind in this. So, I think all these things came up because for the music, musician's survival. Right. Right. If you think I'm not going to do it, well, next time the organizers are not going to ask you. Call you. Call you. <laughs> so, so, like I was saying, a fundamental shift had come and he was training you to be a professional Gavaiya. And in your own mental capacities mm. then at that time, mm. you had decided that you were going to be a professional singer. Mm. Now, you had finished writing this book, you had done your research on being exposed to all these different gharanas mm. and after that you took a conscious decision at some point that Mushtaq Hussain Khasa was somebody that you actively wanted to stick with. Mm. Why? Mm. Why? One great thing is when you become a Ganda Manishishya, mm. then you promise to carry on that karana mm. forward mm. in whatever way you think is correct. Take the karana forward. Mm. And that is why Khansa tested me again and again mm. that will she take the karana forward? Mm. So, uh, and I thought Rampur karana was an assimilation of so many Karanas, mm -hmm. Gwajar basically, and and, uh, uh, and my training in other Karanas. So I found that I was trying to enrich myself, keeping the, the roots firm in their place, foundation in and then give me something of my own. But what, li what did you like about Rampur? There's a lot of mitas in this. But when it comes to different towns, patterns, there's a lot of variation. There's such a wealth of towns in Rampur Gharana, more than any other Gharana, I feel. Mm. Intricate towns, the way it goes up. The variety that we have in Rampur Gharana of Tan. People mm. especially come to me, please, we want to learn towns from you. Mm -hmm. Because Rampur Gharana has its own style of Tan. And yet very melodious. I mean, for instance, if I, uh, when I take tan, I see to it that whatever, as a woman musician, mm -hmm. goes with me, mm -hmm. I take those tan. I'm not going to take those very, very heavy gum up tans. Mm -hmm. I've learned it all. Mm -hmm. But whatever goes with my style, mm -hmm. with my personality, mm -hmm. then I've, I've tried to, I've tried to form a, a, a kind of pattern mm -hmm. within myself how to do a radhana of my notes you know and yet not spoil the personality of that particular rag. Mm -hmm. So I I give emphasis on that also the vadi samvadi I don't want to go wrong there. Mm -hmm. Then I also try to give, try to make 
my composition more meaningful, the words, the literary aspect. Mm -hmm. But in terms of voice projection and opening your voice and exposing the rag right at the outset, the way it's done in Rampur, mm -hmm. what I've always found is that it's almost like everything has been exposed, then it slows down and it becomes more... Uh, encompasses it. No, it becomes slower and then it speeds up again mm. when things, you know, unlike in Jaipur and in Kirana where it moves in a structured way yeah. from single note elaboration to small note clusters yeah. to many note clusters, mm. here you are doing first an immediate exposition, mm. then you are slowing down to single notes. Now I tell you what, yeah. in Rampur, uh, Karana, there, the way I was taught, you take a composition in a rag, particular rag. The bandish, that is. The bandish. Mm. You take the bandish in, and then you used to make me sing in akar, mm -hmm. the same bandish in akar. Right. So, but you have to be very careful that the bandish was correctly composed. Mm -hmm. Bandish took care of the rights and wrongs of the rag. Can't emphasis dena, can't ni dena. So you did your akar on bandish. Mm -hmm. And then it, according to that bandish, mm -hmm. then your birth went. And according to that bandish, then your tons. Mm -hmm. So it was bound to that bandish. Yeah. But did he then train the variation and just say now use the same bandish in a different rag? Yes, I had. <laughs> yes, I learned that also. <laughs> it's a hard task, master. He taught me a bandish, a thumri, a bowl band in the khamaj, hmm. and in ektal, which is a very rare thing. Usually. Thumris are. Tinta. Tinta, Chandra, Chachar, or whatever. So he taught me Thumri in Ekta, in Kamaj. And he said, now this same, sing the Bandish first, then sing Sargam of this Bandish. Then he said, now the same Bandish and the same Tal you sing in Dharam. So I had so I had full control, sharp and flat notes. Mm -hmm. The sargam also, and the and, and the bandish also, which was a very uh, different way of teaching. So it makes you rigorous in the rag, rag, and also makes you rigorous in the bandish. Bandish and the tal, mm -hmm. like some tapa in arachotal, mm -hmm. fourteen matras. Mm -hmm. You usually do the arachotal tapas. Which were composed by Inayatu Sankhasa himself, his father in law. Right. And um, so that kind of grounding one man has had. So I felt that this was a garana, this was a style which I like to say. Hmm. Now, with this exposure and all these different ideas, what made you want to compose and start working in theatre? How did that shift take place? Were you move towards a, a different kind of... Also. Huh. How did that happen? Also. Huh. It's not a shift, but what made it's you not adopt a shift that? at all. Right. It was, when we came to Delhi, uh, it was all tea time ban and cocktail ban, you know, British period war. No one was bothered about classical music. Hmm. And it was at that time when Ravi Shankarji also came to Delhi, he was with All India Radio. I heard a lot of his music also. Mm. He actually was kind enough to play backups at our place also. Mm. Ustad Ali Akbar Khan. So I was influenced by their music also. Right. I was very influenced by their... Uh, um, but there were hardly any takers of classical music. Mm. 
we used to hold little soirees in different homes and uh, uh, I remember when Sudhri Shadrani was bathing her Tulini uh, mm. and so she wanted to collect some funds then Raviji played for Trivini mm. and the tickets were 10 rupees each and we all went, we all supported each other uh, I felt that in order to take classical music exposure to ordinary man mm. yeah, would be a good idea and so then I went into operas also and I like uh, I used different rugs like uh, in Jahara I used when I composed 60 ragas and in Chitralekha Bhagavati Charan Varmas Chitralekha I used 80 ragas in Sundari uh, I used all the Shabats as mentioned in Guru Granth Sahib in those ragas hmm. and, and I found that people loved it in Sony Maival, it was folk and classical. Yeah, so it and means people loved it. You've got to have known 60 rags to be able to compose an opera of 60 rags. It's all uh, gurus. No, 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 no. That's not my point. No, I, that's all very nice. But I'm trying to say, at what point did you become aware mm. of the fact that your uh, knowledge mm. as a musician was becoming so large that your repertoire was increasing? Mm. To the point that were you becoming aware that now that I have control over 60 different drugs or 80 different drugs which you're using, and then you were combining it also with folk music. So that awareness must have come at some point. It just came. You were doing it. I was doing it. So much so Mushtaqus and Kazak came for Soli by one. Hmm. He, he saw that opera and hmm. he was thrilled with it. Because I used all the, I made his son Gulam Taki Khan to sing a tapa in, in my Sony Maiwa. And he was thrilled, he was very happy that I was able to do that. Did you compose other music? You composed five operas? Yes, I composed five operas, yes. And no. anything else that you composed as a music, as a composer? As a composer, then uh, uh, National School of Drama. Mm. I did uh, one or two plays for them, I composed music for them. I see. Um, then, I did, uh, then of course, uh, I've been composing other music also. In films and all, you've, I've seen yeah. that. Documentary films. Yeah. 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 And for ballets and... And for ba yeah, ballets. Why? Well, yes, yes I have. <laughs> I just keep doing it. Did you ever compose your own khayals? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, Tell me more. Any, like... In what sort of rags? Which rags did you compose bandishes in? Were these bandishes or did you compose rags themselves? No, no rags, bandishes. Hmm. Bandishes. Uh, like Marwa. It was my mother's death anniversary. So I composed a khayal on that, which I broadcast. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, I composed a number of bhajans also, many bhajans. Let's see. Um, I composed Tarana also. Let's see. Mm. <laughs> what else did I? I just keep doing it. It's just... No, because I remember I heard uh, a bandish by you in Sarni Bihar. Yes, of course. Yeah. Hmm? Sarni Bihar. There yeah. was that bandish, Nada Bheda. Nada Bheda Aparampar. Hmm. Hmm? Then, yeah, the Sami Bihar, yes. And what was the bandish in Marwa? Jai 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 Mahadevi. And can you remember any of the other rags in which you've composed bandishes? Well, often I don't, but. Uh, like uh, in that. Jaj Bilawal. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> hmm? Yes. You have a bandish in that. Bandish, yes, I have. And the the Jaktal bandish in Jaj Bilawal is a very old traditional bandish of Rampur Karana. Then I did this, uh, I've taken Kabir's 
Pramika mm. and I set it to Jaij I see. And uh, I got, got the green signal, I sang for Thakusa first. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's correct, it's absolutely right. So now I keep, even last month when I was singing in Kamani. So I there are different kinds of things. I mean, I have a long list somewhere of all the bandishes that I know that you have penned on your own rather than the ones that you have traditionally learned. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to understand, if I look at the pattern, that all these are sometimes bandishes in rather unusual rags. rags. It just comes naturally, you know. I don't specially sit that I'm composing this rag. Mm -hmm. It just comes. Like uh, the different uh, stutis and things like that. Guru Purnima. Mm -hmm. I was travelling by train and I suddenly the words came like jotted down on the road. And I taught my which the girls performed for IGNCA. Right. So it just comes, it just comes somewhere. Okay. At what stage did you realize that the rare rags or a prachalit need more direct attention? You know, uh, ever since we started having so many festivals of music all over the country. Mm -hmm. I found that uh, those 10 or 12 musicians, all well-known musicians, they were repeating mostly, I mean, generalize it, uh, like a couple of morning ragas, a couple of afternoon ragas, a couple of evening, late night, whatever. And as a result, we're losing out on so many ragas which are there, which have been there for, for years, hundreds and hundreds of, hundreds of years. No one is bothered about them. Mm -hmm. That means unless you, unless you perform, mm -hmm. or you have the opportunity to perform, mm -hmm. though some of those very ragas are in the books also, mm -hmm. but unless you perform, how would people know? What they are. Well, apart from people knowing you yourself, lose the knowledge. You know, of course you lose knowledge. And there's so much, and why should we lose? Why, why, should, we, why should we let that happen? So I, in my small way, hmm. <coughs> started doing, working on this. Like I organized a festival, hmm. completely by women. Hmm. Um, in, and the theme was upper. And you'll be surprised <coughs> that there are musicians who know these rags, but they don't get an opportunity to perform. Mm -hmm. Because people are afraid that whether people, the audience will like it or not. And when I did this, people said, why have you, haven't you done it in a bigger auditorium? Yeah. I said I was afraid and for that also I wrote personally, personally to each invitee as to why I have taken up this theme. Mm. I want people to be aware of this and it went out very well. Yeah, I mean after that now it's become a big thing and the Sangeet Natak Academy is doing it and yeah. now musicians are coming out with albums on yeah. their arts and it's album. become a whole trend. Yeah. But yeah. Um, tell me what was in your mind, apart from giving exposure to these different rags, mm. did you feel that you hadn't been able to share your knowledge? Uh, you know, when you are performing, uh, you have to see as to where you are performing. Mm. Mm. What kind of audience is there? Mm. So I also went to the extent to saying that, all right, if you get an hour and a half for your performance, let's see one prachalit mm. and, and let's see one apachalit. Yeah. And people will accept it, which they did to a certain extent. So in the 50s and 60s, the crisis in Delhi was partition and no audience for classical music mm. and your effort then was operas. Mm. In the 80s, you felt that women musicians needed to be... 
especially women music, musicians who didn't belong to musician family. I wanted them to have a platform, who had learned at the feet of great masters and had also done Shastra mm. in classical music. Mm. They should have an opportunity. So, in, and then finally this thing about sharing the knowledge and widening yeah. the base for yeah. Yeah. these rare and unusual yeah. rats. What I'm trying to get at is that in many ways your interests and exposures and things that you did for yourself personally at some point in your career you turned them into something public. You turned it into yeah. a public movement. Yes, I tried to. I tried to. Yes. So your efforts at making things into a public discourse has always come out of a personal journey. Always. Yeah. When I took up women musicians, what I had been through, mm. the difficult, the struggle that I went through, mm. later on where I reached, whatever, but earlier the struggle that I went through, mm. it wasn't easy mm. and yet I never gave up. So that was the idea of starting a movement on that aspect. Then again, a Prasilitra. Mm. So tell me about this thing for women musicians. What did you try and do for women musicians? What was your quest? My quest was that women musicians who don't belong to musician family, their approach to music is different. They, they will never go to an organizer and say, Sabham kutamaka chahiye. Mm. You have to give me this opportunity. Mm. I would never be able to speak that language. Mm. Because with them is the way of life. Mm. They've got to do it, they've got to have it. I would say, why should I ask? Mm. Why am I, aren't I noticed? I've worked hard. I've mm. learned at the feet of great masters. Mm. So you felt women musicians who didn't necessarily come from musicians' families, were not getting noticed and were not getting exposure. Yeah. And they were not getting noticed because there was a control on the music scene, yeah. which was that you had to belong to a particular family. Family. To, though there were I mean, the women musicians in Maharashtra, there were many, mm. but not to that extent. In Bengal, there's a tradition of music, mm. you know, classical music, whatever. but. In this part of North India. India, no, there's no question. You know, that kind of a thing. Not as a profession. Even when I was producing operas, then the parents would say, Nisha, no, you stage many I'm talking of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Mm -hmm. Their daughters must be uh, going to cocktail parties and dancing, mm -hmm. doing ballroom dancing, but Getting to come on the stage. Tell me, learning classical music in the 30s and in that environment of nationalism and things in India at that time, um, was there a, a, a movement that this is our true heritage and our true music? And was there, do you think it was, it made it a little easier to learn Indian classical music rather than? Then I think it was that the whole thing was independence of India. Mm. Everyone was going to join. Uh, we had the models like Sarojini Naidu, Sushila Naya, the women and all that. Mm. No one thought about music at that time. And don't forget, in Punjab especially, mm. in Punjab especially, it was always looked down upon. It was a Kodiwali who said. So then when I started this, I one of the items always used to be like classical music, Khumri Dadra, mm -hmm. which was essentially labeled for Kotevalis mm -hmm. at that time. I got it out. Now tell me, were, this must have been a part of a much larger movement. I mean, many people must have been trying to take away the stigma from the women musicians at that time. Well, some, you know, some appreciated this, this mm -hmm. what I started. Mm -hmm. Some said, some guy is doing what you are doing. You know, but I wasn't bothered about that because I know that 
It was the first time in the history of India that I organized Talmadya Kacheri by women only, mm -hmm. in which there were tabla, pakhavaj, tavil, mridandam, gattam, all South Indian percussion, all done by women. They traveled from all over, Bangalore, Chennai, Cochin, Orissa. They came with babes in their arms. Their husbands came along. Mm -hmm. I made arrangements for them to stay. And I invited them to come two days earlier where they held rehearsals. And uh, so this was the first time in the history that the main art, Talmadha Kachari was one, mm -hmm. and the main artist as well as the accompanists were also with them, mm -hmm. which was again an eye opener. Yeah, so all these tabla players and all, sarangi players and all, all women. All women. Flute. Uh, and uh, and you'll be very happy to know that some of these, like Tavi player from Chennai, who used to get 25 rupees for playing in a temple, mm -hmm. 25 rupees, she's, she was invited all over to play Tavla and give recitals. Mm -hmm. Other women also, after this, it is only after that that people like Anuradha Pal, they formed their history something, mm -hmm. and then the now she is mm -hmm. taken from. So it's <laughs> becoming a much wider movement. A wider movement. So I was very, I feel very happy about it, mm. that more and more, whatever the, they're taking it forward. Mm. But it was my, I tried to do it in my original way, but it was my, it was, and they're already learned the uh, musicians. Mm. They've learned from great masters. So, carrying on with this um, thing of, you know, uh, Prachalitra's on the one hand, mm. folk music, on the other. Mm -hmm. huh? Don't you think it's a, a rather wide uh, span for a musician to be able to try and control? Well, as you know, I was born and brought up in Jodhpur. Mm -hmm. And while I lived there, I was never, never attracted by Rajasthan music. It was all. Roshdara Begum, it was Melan Ralvias. And that's all. And years and years later, when I had to do my PhD, that, uh, the urge in me was very strong that I want to know more and more about folk music of Rajasthan. Mm. And I approached Thakur Sam, Thakur Zadi Singh Ji, that this is what is happening. Do you think, as a classical musician, it's right for me to take up this topic? And he said, of course, where do we think classical music came from? Mm. He said, I wish more and more classical musicians would understand that. The need to study folk music. Folk music. And he said, just, you must do it. Well, I'll come with you wherever you go. Mm. And he went with me. We travelled all over. Rajasthan. Rajasthan. And it was an eye opener. Were you traveling in the Mewar area or the Marwar area? Marwar, hmm. Marwar mostly. Hmm. Uh, without tape recorders from that, that time. And we were working like 14 hours a day. I can see because there are so many bandishes in this book hmm. and such a variety of bandishes. And I can see that the divisions. Um, you know, there's a, such a compl complex documentation of all these songs and you've given it along with the Notation. notations. Some of the songs, yes. Mm. Mm. Um, did you ever hope that musicians in Rajasthan itself would start using notations? Did you find this business of notating Indian music is a desirable thing? Well, at least we preserve them that way mm. because oral tradition, as you know, like some of the musicians, the the the, the jatis, mm. the certain tribes who sing that, the oral tradition, they had their own grammar, mm. which was amazing, which was beautiful. They had their like jangra form. Mm. They had different grammar: su jangra and tori jangra and swarat jangra. And every time you ask them, ask them to sing a genre of uh, that particular raga, 
Let it be executed same rules. But it's not seven mantras of our classical uh, music, uh, rupa, kvatira. It's their own seven mantras of Rajasthani music. Where is the sun? Where is the kali? And so Thakur says, stop it now. With such a rich tradition, did you ever try and incorporate that into your classical music? Of course I did. That's right. <laughs> Especially in my tumoris. Right. Like I brought mand. Hmm. Whatever I sing, even now, uh, when I'm singing, a, perhaps I'm singing a tumor in command or I'm singing whatever, from somewhere the other the mind comes in. Right. It's, it's just ingrained. It's, I don't know why, but it just comes. Hmm. It's a certain harkat, which we call it. Harkat ajati hai, that little uh, grace note that comes in, that uh, kind of using that voice. Uh, uh, and sometimes, uh, like tappa, we have a tap, tappe ki taan in khal, you have tappe ki taan in khumri. It just comes. Because I mean, you've got to have control over your uh, styles hmm. and in your voice. Your voice, because you're cultivating your voice in such a way that you can switch over to, to a tappa taan or you can switch over to a a different drug and then blend it again and come back to do this. Right. And in the opera years, how many years, how many hours a day were you people rehearsing? Oh, rehearsal on four to five hours. Mm -hmm. Again, and over a period of about a year. Because, you know, I, I, I went in the opera room, I went uh, in, in a very systematic way. Uh, I got uh, uh, first, of course, the libretto. And then I set it to music, mm -hmm. and uh, then a producer, mm -hmm. uh, then a set designer, then a costume designer. I was lucky, first fortunate enough to have them from NST, mm -hmm. like BB Karant helped me to produce uh, Jahara and mm -hmm. Chitraneka, uh, and I had people uh, from NST to do the sets. What made you select certain operas at certain times? It's very interesting because <clears> He <throat> Ranja is an opera you did in what were the years? 56. 56, 57. And it's a love story about? He and Ranja from Punjab. Yes. And she's left. What happens in the end? It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy, yeah. No, I'm trying to ask, what is the point of the tragedy? How is that tragedy being used? It's post-partition Delhi. Did you feel that Heer's condition is related to the state of a divided Punjab and the people of India? The loss of a culture and an area of Western Punjab, which, she's, which is the language in which she is singing, there is this nostalgia and pathos in Heer, which is... Well, there are a number of things. It's your perception also. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will. I, I would also say that partition had just taken place. It was a lot of nostalgia, mm -hmm. a lot of nostalgia, and to hear that music, to see those costumes, to see that village life, um, people were drawn towards it completely, and the use of. The different dressers that I use in, the, in these operas helped a lot. But if you say that these people were nostalgic about it, that our Punjab is gone, but we must try and preserve the culture, mm -hmm. and which we uh, later on followed it by Sony Vaiwa. And, and as far as music is concerned, I use different drugs and folk tunes. Mm -hmm. Again, Sohni Maivar. Sohni Maivar. Again, it's the land, the womb, the land. which she holds in yeah. the khara. Yeah. You know, these symbols yeah. in the... Paint. Well, yeah, the, the, the village, village. The idea of, you know, as urban people now living in a metropolitan city, mm. there is this sense of a loss of looking back at yeah. 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 a life that was there, there in the life of the migrant which yeah. is now who is now living in the 
urban, sp sp urban space. Mm. These are strategically chosen operas. These mm. are strategically chosen stories. Mm. Tell me, can I ask you a, a tricky question? <laughs> With Jahmar, mm. what was the year? 1970. 70. Were you ever aware of the fact that Jahara claimed to power was because she was the daughter of the she, emperor, emperor, who is separated from her, from her lover. lover? Is that not what was panning out in the political environment in India with Mrs. Gandhi, the daughter of Nehru, who is <laughs> separated and not Ara. Was this not what was actually going oh, well. on <laughs> in each opera in 1979-80, when Sikh militancy is yeah. at, coming up in yeah. India? Yeah. You choose to do Mata Sundari, who is a militant Sikh, yeah. right? Yeah. Who comes up yeah. huh? and you deal with the whole notion of the Khalsa just before the whole Hindra Valley thing and it all erupts. In 1970, just before emergency erupts and there's the rise of Jahanara's power, almost separated now as a single woman, and there is, it's before, just before emergency when Mrs. Gandhi's power happens. In the 1950s and 60s, you're still dealing with a partition nostalgia. Tell me, this must, at least subconsciously, you must be aware of the fact that these stories topicality for your audience was it was a thought out thing well to a certain extent yes and as uh, i mean as it has always been happening i've always been taking up the challenges as far as uh, jamara is concerned well this topic that you mentioned, mm -hmm. somewhere behind my back of my mind, there. but I was told, why do you always take up Punjabi operas? Why can't you do something in Urdu? Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know Urdu, but then a couple of friends said, well, that can be managed. Mm -hmm. And I approached Rifat Sarosh, who was a well-known Urdu poet, and he was with All India Radio. And he suggested that why don't I take up Jahamara as, as a subject? As a subject. That will give. I mean, you've done two operas in Punjabi, the costumes, the sets, the environment, everything. Now this will be completely different. Was Chitra Lekha before or after? After. Mm -hmm. And so Rifat did the libretto and I set to music and I was an acting also. Uh, and funny enough, we were a big cast there, nobody knew Urdu. Mm -hmm. So our script was written in Devanagari mm -hmm. and Rifat Sarosh used to come twice a week for the rehearsals to guide us with the other first mm -hmm. and um, at the end we thought it, it was a big hit. We had people standing in the queue outside, uh, fine arts where we staged, you know, it's a pro house. And uh, there were Mercedes Benz there and women in Burka coming there and we just went on and on. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I received a nine page letter mm -hmm. in Urdu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except for how she does. No, this was Kala Akshar, that is Barada. Mm. I said, no, what do I do with this? It was all praises for this. Mm. <clears throat> so what I want to tell you, it was very well accepted, received. Then someone challenged me. What's this, Urdu and, in, and, and uh, Punjabi? What's wrong with Hindi? So I decided to take up Chitra Lekha. And I, I was very fortunate that at that time, at that period of time, Bhagati Charan Varma, the author, he was alive. Mm. So I went to him and I 
wanted his permission in writing that I can state this as an author. He said, by all means. I still got that letter permission to somewhere like that in his own handwriting. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to music in eighty dollars. So on the opening night, he came on stage and he said, I was only 28 years old when I wrote this. I never knew what I was writing for. People tried to find philosophy in it, people tried to find so many things. I was like, I don't like that. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And uh, he says, it has been filmed twice. One was with Mehta in which there were eight songs in that film and they were all in Ram Bhairdi. I see. All the eight songs were in Bhairdi. Then, the second time it was filmed, it was on with Nina Kumari. Mm -hmm. I said, this is the, I want to say this. This is the first time I find, he took my name, that this chitra lekha ka mene chitran kiya hai hmm. apne novel mein ji sahi so tell me did you feel that you know in each of these operas you you were increasing the number of rags you were using so when you came to chitra lekha did you feel most confident by that stage in terms of your deployment of different rasas in different parts oh, of yes oh yes i enjoyed it very hmm. i enjoyed this the rehearsals that we went through. So tell me that in that case, do you, as a musician, are you comfortable saying that if I want to deploy uh, Karuna, mm. immediately what comes into your mind? In an opera, the proceeding? No, 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 but if I, if you are so confident about using rasas, do you associate like the way in the ancient texts they link rasas with different rags? Mm. Are you, do you do that also? Do you follow us? Shankaran's method, or do you follow some other classical treatment? I go by the dialogue that is there. The story, mm -hmm. the dialogue that is there. And you'll bring Karuna into it? I'll bring Karuna into it. In whatever art you want to? I want to. But it should blend with the previous lines that someone else has sung. But other, now, okay, if you want to bring Vita mm -hmm. into a particular piece mm -hmm. of music, how do you choose to bring it in? Now, whatever the dialogue is going on, it's with that force, mm -hmm. with that force. But you don't find that there are specific notes which will help you? Of course the notes help. Now what if that note is not there in that rag that you want to use which will allow you to show empathy or which will allow you to show heroism. If it's not there in that particular rag, if there is a particular, like they say that the Dhaivat in Hamir always helps in bringing out Vita. They say that uh, you know, using certain komal swars in certain ways helps in bringing out uh, karuna. Mm -hmm. What if that particular komal swar is not there in that rag? But you know, you don't have hard and fast rule there. The previous, the, the other person was singing, and he's shouting, and he's showing his vita, and the other person, if I've got to do it, namrata ke saath, I'll blend Hamid, supposing I'm taking Hamid, and then I'll take Ramkali. Whatever goes with it, it blends into each other. It should stand out that this is Ramkali, this is this. It is this a blend with it. It is part and parcel of the whole. You transit from one into the other. One. And this, you know, just like that. It's just smoothly each other. It is not jarring at all, which is the most beautiful part there when I composed uh, operas. Mm -hmm. I didn't say, that, all right, now I've got to take Jinjoti for this. Portion. Now I've got to take this rag for this. Now I've got to take this rag. I've to the body. No, no. Or this Jajivanti. There are certain songs, the poetry, the poem that is there, and the theme, the topic is like Shahja and Jamara. I set some of his portion in the body mm -hmm. In In some portion where Jamara is singing and she's Giving up the world and the lover is gone, I've set it in joke. Right. And same way, uh, in Jamara, for instance, the, 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 the girlfriends of Jamara are singing, and so I've done it in a very lively, bangishly. 
Mm-hmm. So it depends on yeah. and what the previous note is, what the previous pitch is. The pitch also has to, has to be taken into consideration. Right. Which is because if I am starting in, in one pitch and someone else comes in another pitch, it's discordant. It's terrible. It, it's meaningless. Hmm. So this means that a musician who is experimenting with your, you know, these days we use the word fusion a lot. Yeah. Huh? But this was like a kind of an experimentation that you were doing yeah, yeah. with your grounding in yeah. classical music and yeah. employing it in yes. in different ways. Yes. And that's how people started liking classical music. And after that, it's not only by off. After that, people who were performing festivals of classical music, I think we all, in our own way, hmm. we were trying to do our best. I mean, at that period, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan was there, Ravi Shankarji was there, and then some of the, uh, Sheila Gargandi was there. And, you know, I, in my small way, whatever, Sundar Shidrani, in a way, you know, we all did something or the other. And uh, so we tried to enrich Delhi. But, okay, Delhi <laughs> and India's problems apart, what about traveling abroad? What about audiences outside India for Indian music? Yes. Uh, in the 60s, early <clears throat> 60s, I found there were hardly any takers of hope for vocal music. They were more for dance, because a lot of dancers had already started going to the West. Of course, since the 30s and 20s. Yeah, and yeah. 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 And you know, uh, music is abstract, dance has a visual impact. The dancer, the movements, the mudras, the costumes. Helps. Helps. In vocal music, you got to stand on your own. And if your ears are not conditioned to it, <coughs> it becomes difficult to appreciate. So in the initial year, in 1960, that was the first time I went in a cultural delegation. Mm-hmm. And I was going to all these uh, Middle Eastern countries. Mm-hmm. I went to Sudan, I went to Egypt, I went to Iran, I went to Turkey, I went to Greece. Um, Iran. Mm-hmm. And I had to be very careful as to what I... There was no question of singing a Vilambit Khayal there. It would mean nothing to them. So I always started with a Durga Khayal. Mm-hmm. On a tarana, which had a lot of rhythm. <clears throat> then I interspersed it with one folk song. Mm-hmm. So that sustained their interest. I see. So you have to be very careful as to what you are presenting, where. And by the time you were singing the, you know, like now when you go and sing abroad and things that you are singing in. Europe and in America. Yes, I. I What's the audience like now? Audience is really good now. I, I've been singing Vilambit Khayal also. I've been singing the Truth Khayal also, Tarana. Like I would sing here. And the audience was very good, for instance, in, uh, in Vienna. Mm. I found it was an Austrian was sitting in the audience and he wanted to know whether there were Khayals in Sanskrit. Mm. Luckily, fortunately for me, I had learned a mm-hmm. couple of khayals in Sanskrit and I was very impressed because the people had been interested. And of course Vienna, as you know, where the operas, the tradition of operas, so they were more... You know, this is it, about voice cultivation right. and singing. You're able to sing, I find, like in Vienna mm-hmm. and in certain concert halls in America, they can still have spaces where Musicians are invited to sing without a microphone. Yes. You know, in India, we've lost that. We've lost it, unfortunately. Now, tell me, do you feel that your accompanists these days are able to perform without a microphone? Are your sarangi players and tabla players able to perform without a microphone? Well, they can play, but somehow they feel that their instrument is subdued. With the voice? Yeah. So, in like the traditional way of playing forcefully, forget about keeping the voice to come out. Mm. 
in a full way. Mm -hmm. That too, it's not just it's not just affected because you know in academic circles we keep talking about how voice cultivation has now become microphone oriented. Yeah. yeah. But what I'm trying to get at is that it's even the accompanying orchestra mm -hmm. has become incapable of producing music without a microphone today. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I remember that occurrence in the Amherst concert hall where everyone had to be given mics because your orchestra was not able to play yeah. without yeah. microphones. Yeah. I, I, I sang without them. You sang without, I the sang microphone. without the microphone. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. I remember that, yes. Uh, this kind of thing, I mean, what do you think we need to do today to be able to keep that quality of voice, voice. still alive? Very, it's very essential. It's very essential because nothing like a true voice. Nothing like a true voice. I mean, for my, you've got to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. Kind of a thing. Why are you straining yourself when the mic is taking it? I said, no, this is, this is I'm singing, I want to give vent to my feelings. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to subdue my voice because of the microphone. What I can give to my true voice, I can't bring the feeling with the microphone. This is how I feel. Mm. And that helped me in the when I sang in the operas also. Mushtaq Hussain Hansa taught you to say a souls. So during Maharam, mm. uh, the, the musicians are not allowed to sing, mm. you know. And uh, but uh, according to Tagusa. Uh, the, the professional musician had to keep the voice agile. agile absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that soon after Muhammad, mm -hmm. if they had, they were invited somewhere, they were ready. The voice was ready. But it's a classic form of lamentation on these songs. It is, it is, it is. And in that, if you notice the way it was composed, it has a little bit of patterns, very intricate mm -hmm. patterns. So your voice is in in good form all the time, which then later on you use in your khayal, you use in your tarana. But you tell me, as a proper, uh, you know, with all these bhajans being composed and this whole move for the for Hindu tradition in classical music and mm -hmm. all the rest of it, mm -hmm. you as a musician with learning from Mushtaqa Sam Khansa felt no such thing about learning uh, a song specially for Muharram and learning something which yeah. is so distinctly Islamic quote unquote. No, in fact, when I was learning from Mushtaqus and Khasa, Thakur Sab said, So Zerusi Lena, Unko both so Ziyad hai, Ye Khasiyat hai Unki, Zerusi Lena. And, but Khasa said bhajans, Usi Shraddha ke saad. He taught me some bhajans. And uh, with that same Shraddha, he never said, Ye, 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 Go, you know. Mm. So the voice was trained accordingly. Let's hear it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've spoken so much. I don't know whether I'd be doing justice to. Kisine kufe ke raste pe shayko.
the voice production, voice culture. So I mean, and that pukar. That that pukar. pukar. This idea of being able to project. Project. So is there that you know this criticism that I used to read sometimes in the press kind of thing that her music is so emotional it becomes over emotional. <laughs> is this even a valid criticism? It's not valid. I want to be emotional. Right. I want to. Uh, I want you to hear my what my emotions are in this particular rag. Mm. This is my approach to this rag. This is the personality of the rag. This is. It is Bhagishri. It is pesos. I want to show those pesos. Yeah. I'm just not saying Kovan Janda, Lelo, Madam Peruk, Joy Panch. No, no, no. This is the Swarup of the rag. And this is the personality of that rag. That should come out of it. Pahape, emotion. Emotion is not a gana kyana. You do your riyas, you, you strike a note, and then you. It's not coming right. And then when it comes right, it's without emotion. <laughs> what is emo if music has no emotion, then what is it? Can you call it emotion? Music. And yet at the same time, never break away from the grammar. Yeah. Never, and never strike the note wrong. Wrong. Absolutely not. Grammar rules don't break the rules. That's one thing I've always tried to do. Don't break the rules. Whatever in whatever way, for whatever way you have been enriched by other people's music or different gharanas. You stick to your gharana, but blending, bringing. But for able, being able to understand this, what you're doing, the audience needs to be mature. Of course, but people don't have the time today to, to, to listen to a rag in depth. Now you have to, in three minutes, if you are asked to do a darbari, and in three minutes you are asked to do, uh, uh, you cover the the the, the gamut of those notes there. But you think you can cover the depth? Like, uh, like uh, uh, this khayal uh, of darbari by Thakusa, when his wife died and he composed a trial in Darbari, hmm. which is a, I mean, his heart broken and he proved to be being a guitar. Now, how do you do that? You have to do it within those motions, hmm. within that framework. Hmm. In fact, in some rag, like he used to say, Taan bhi kya zarurat hai? If you take Taans in Darbari, to usme or Adana ne kya parak rahega? So here yeah, understanding comes only if you have a, a good audience who is you're in that milieu. In that milieu. But then to survive <laughs> in this, then if you have been given all right one hour or half an hour, then you try you know somebody close to get that support. Every good even type of looks will that though. The other day I I switched over the, on to this Hari Balam, this thing. And people are sitting there, they are appreciating it. Somebody's kitno koti, I don't know. Mm. But at least they have a tradition. If we have an audience who is a connoisseur who tries to learn, he can't become an expert. He needn't be a performer. But if there is a, an audience who appreciated, understood, it makes all the difference to the musician. Mm. And he's able to give much more, not only to himself, the satisfaction to himself or to herself, mm -hmm. but the audience also. But then the audience has to hear more and more because the more you hear classical music, the more it grows on it.
Chungri and Dadra with a typical lilt and poignant depth of the Pura Bang, uh, Andaman, Khori, Kajri, or Chaiti can see her voice dance sentimentally. Her music is always expressive and emotive. Apart from being a celebrated vocalist, she is also an eminent musicologist and has published over 40 papers on the subject. Further, she has produced two substantial pieces of research, the first providing a statistic analysis and uh, history of the eight major Hindustani gharanas, and the second, her doctorate, was an in-depth musicological analysis and documentation of the folk music of Rajasthan. In 1992, her enormous repertoire of traditional compositions and rare ragas was recorded by the Fort Foundation for the SRA Kolkata. She was subsequently awarded, recorded by UNESCO in Paris as part of the intangible heritage of the world. She was given the honor, honorific of Alpin Bulbul, the Golden Nightingale of the East, by UNESCO. <laughs> Formerly member of the Executive Board and General Council of the Center Sangeet Natak Academy, Shana Khurana has served on many expert committees, including the Board of Research Studies for MPL and PhD of the Faculty of Music and Fine Arts, Delhi University, and Northeastern Hill University. She has been a member of the Governing Council and of ICCR, and also on its various expert committees, including those of the Ministry of Culture. For the past six years, she has also been on the expert committee of the Tableau of the Republic Day celebration. Welcome to St. Stephen's College. The first thing that I want to tell you is that uh, whenever I come to universities and uh, colleges and schools, when I see young people all around me, it makes me feel very good and happy. Really, really. As we were driving down, I was half asleep. But as soon as I entered here and saw you all, I felt good. <laughs> How is it? that folk music ends up making such an important impact in your life and work as a classical musician, why is it that as a khayal singer and as a Hindustani classical singer, you decided to write a PhD on folk music of Rajasthan? Well, uh, firstly, I'm a classical singer for most I mean, there's no question about it. All my life has gone into it. I must, I must tell you the, the background. I was born and brought up in Jodhpur, in Rajasthan. And while I lived there, folk music of Rajasthan didn't attract me. It didn't. And uh, all that I was... I used to think about is at the age of eight and ten <coughs> that I want to learn classical music. I heard a lot of music of uh, Pandit Narayan Rao Vyas, Patwardhanji, and I wanted to learn classical music and nothing else. I don't know why I was not attracted by folk music of Rajasthan. But after my dissertation on Khayal Gai Ki Me Vivid Gharane, in which I researched uh, on eight major gharanas of, uh, of our Khayal music, I realized that what is the root of all this? I went to different gurus, I learned about, tried to understand about their gaiki. I tried to understand what were the nuances of that particular gharana, whether it was Gwalior, whether it was Agra gharana, or whether uh, it was Bindi Bazar gharana, or Kirana gharana, Rampur gharana, my gharana I belong to. And I found that some of the ragas which are included in, in our classical music in Bhat Khandis book, there's some of the ragas like Mand, Jangla, 
and so many others have been accepted by the classical form. So, a gaudy. So I thought that I have to know more about folk music. And I approached my guru, Thakur Jadev Singh Ji, who was a very eminent musicologist, and I had the fortune of sitting at his feet, and I knew him very well. He treated me like his daughter. I went to him. I was afraid of approaching this subject. I said, Thakur Sahib, I'm a classical musician, and I have this terrible urge to know more about Rajasthani music. Is it right for me to take up this topic? Because, you know, I always felt that a lot of people thought that uh, working on, on, on other music, other than classical music, like folk music and thing, it's a come down. And I didn't want, because by that time, I had already made a little niche for myself in classical music. And I didn't know what to do, but the urge was very strong. So he looked up to me and he said, why not? Where do you think classical music came from? Classical music, the root of classical music, is folk music. And he said, go ahead with this. So that's how I decided to do work, do research on folk music of Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. And that was a, that process of years that was an eye-opener for me, revelation for me, because the things that I learned of Rajasthani folk music, I just can't, I just can't tell you how beautiful that music is and there's so much, so much material that I was told by Thakur Sahib, one lifetime is not enough to know about Rajasthani music. So the very music that you were born into, yes. you were saying that you had no interest in it when you were a girl, Yes. but you developed an interest in it much later in life. Much later. Uh, I feel I must have imbibed without knowing unconsciously, I was taking Rajasthani music all in me. Hmm. Like Maan, for instance, I, you know, it was, um, it was, it was the days of Rajas and Maharajas, and I remember that the sound of Maan coming from Chota Babji, Chota Babji was known as Maharaja's youngest son, and to, to our bungalow, it just came and I just kept listening to it. I find that Bollywood has been so accepting of the folk music traditions of India. You know, one thinks of movies that have been made and soundtracks that have been made over the past 40 years. They've been so innovative. And when you think of so many composers in, in Bombay, they've been so accepting of folk music traditions as they were originally of classical music traditions. If I think of the kind of music that was there in Bombay cinema 40, 50 years ago, it was so clearly based on Hindustani music. Yeah. And at the same time, there was so much folk music that, was, that has always continued. Yeah. Why has the classical music world been so closed to learning about and studying folk music? As I said, as far as Bollywood is concerned, folk music and classical music, they've been the think tank. Mm. They got everything from there. They got different uh, tunes, mm. uh, they got different tals, different kind of laikari, and also the, the folk instruments they used in some of the films, mm. whether it was Maharashtra, whether it was Rajasthan, whether it was Bengal, because we have a 
very rich, rich repertoire of uh, uh, folk music. All the regions are so rich that, uh, and out of these folk tunes, the Bollywood directors like Noshad and other people, mm. they picked up tunes and you'll be very surprised to know that some of these tunes were later developed and they developed into proper ragas with proper definition and swaroop personality. Mm -hmm. And they picked up because they had such a variety, mm. such a variety that um, it was wonderful. So you didn't feel in any way that it was going to damage your career as a classical singer? Well, it was very challenging, mm. very challenging because in our country there is a, a kind of, shall I say, tradition <laughs> or shall I say, um, if a classical musician sings folk, they said, Arya sahab, ye to folk gaati hai. Mm. You know? Or if you go into song dramas and operas, then say, Arya sahab, ye to opera. Classical. But they don't realize that it's out of this folk music and classical music that other forms came up. Mm. So the Bollywood people also took advantage of this and they were able to give a, a large variety. What was your intention with those operas which you composed? Were they uh, classical music operas or were they folk music? What was their musical base? Both. The first two operas that I did were based on folk music of Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. He, Ranja and Soni Maiwal. When we came to Delhi, I found people here were not very interested in classical music. Post-partition, say around about 47, 48, 49, they were not interested. All they knew uh, was about tea time band and cocktail band and clubs and things like that. And I began to wonder, what is that that we should give to people, make them understand that we, had, we have such a rich heritage? And what can I do about it? Then I thought of including or having the base of classical ragas in the operas, like the Urdu opera that I did, Jahara. Then I did an opera, staged an opera, or Chitralekha. In Jahara, I used 80 ragas. In uh, Chitralekha, and Bhagwati Babu was alive. I don't know whether you have heard the name of Bhagwati Charan Burma. He was a great writer, novelist. He wrote a very famous uh, Upanyas novel on uh, Chitralekha, which belonged to, to the, the, the Mauryan period. And uh, in that I composed and I used 80 ragas. And of course, with sets and help from NSD and everything, we organized big shows, which were very successful. And I was, I was so happy that the audience, they left it. They just liked it. We had long queues waiting outside to come in. And uh, so the, I tried to use classical music as the base in my operas. And then how was folk music brought into it? Folk music like Heer Ranja and Soni Maiwal. Mm. Heer Ranja was purely folk, Punjabi folk. Mm -hmm. But when I did Soni Maiwal, I put in a bit of classical music, ragas, so that the people get used to it. They, they register as to what I'm saying. And by the time I came to uh, Sundari, which was an opera, uh, opera. It was a novel written by uh, Bhai Veer Singh, and it was the first novel which was written in Gurmukhi uh, script. Script, 1895. 
uh, in that uh, I every time I did something it was with an aim that was there and in Sundari I wanted to use the ragas that are in the Shabad in in Guru Granth Sahib. I'm not a Sikh but somehow that attracted me and I didn't know how to work on it. Uh, I wanted to take up the partition theme but I was advised not to take that because we didn't want Kala Jhanda outside in some <laughs> form or the other. And uh, I took up those Shabads and I composed them in the same rag as mentioned in Guru Granth Sahib. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea of it. it. Every opera was it was classical music. I have a recording from that and we're going to play that. Which one? From Sundari. Oh. And um, can we play that? try to do it by uh, in my classical in Makhaz also throw of voice uh, it's very essential because that gives vent to your feelings um, what I'm intrigued by is how is it that you feel that an engagement with folk music and working in so many different regional languages and absorbing the sahitya or the literature of these different languages has helped you as a classical musician? Very much. Hmm. First of all, all the rasas that are there come from the different nuances, khatkas, throwing of voice, adhering to the kaku bhet of classical music. So all this uh, folk music, I think my voice must have picked up from there. It's not that we don't have khatkas in classical music, it's not that we don't have meaned in this way, but the way they do it probably had an you know, influence on me. But in terms of the poetry, how does that improve your work as a classical musician? How do you feel that learning the languages, mm. I mean, by how we, when you were doing the documentation of Rajasthani folk songs, um, you're a Marwadi speaker or? Yes, I can speak Marwadi, I think I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and there was so long time ago. And Punjabi is a language that you're Punjab, familiar with. That's right. Um, Apart from Rajasthan and Punjab, did you learn the folk music of any other part of the country or, or the world? Well, I've traveled a lot all over the world and uh, I found uh, when I was traveling to Middle Eastern countries, of all the countries, in Egypt, for instance, mm. That Arabic music, I found very ringing in my ears. In Greece, when I heard their music, folk songs, Rag Jogia was ringing in my ears. And in Syria, again, 
the, the in Syria again I like I like Arabic music and Arabic Arabic speaking. Sometimes the use of half note. When I say half note, it means in our classical music, for instance, when you read about different ragas in a book, there's so many flat notes and so many should and komal. But they don't say, they can't work out how much microtonal difference, difference is there. Like in Rag Tori, the komal gandhar is different to komal gandhar of Rag Multani. To what extent? And that is in our folk songs also. And we have in our raga system also. And I found the same thing when I heard this music abroad in the Middle Eastern countries especially. So that commonality was there. And uh, uh, using microtonal differences is what gives personality to that particular rag. And I think that was when your study on uh, the weave of folk songs across the world came out at that time, yes. as a result of that. Yes, that came out at that time, perhaps I wrote on that. Yes, uh, because I found so much commonality in, in all the folk songs. I found uh, there were so many com uh, common factors. The, the theme, Hmm. We have Vira Ke Geet abroad also, they have Vira Ke Geet. Hmm. We have lullabies, they have lullabies. We have satire, they have satire. We talk about Nanandiya Jethaniya and Sas hmm. in our Tumris and we talk even in, in our uh, Khayals, even there. In Czechoslovakia I heard, in Romania, I heard. Then, lament. In and in Punjab, we have when somebody dies, we have van. <coughs> Funeral songs. We have calendric music. Mm -hmm. We have. Uh, Mm, so uh, calendric songs, songs are again, are again there, mm. like uh, Varsha Kal Ka and Basant mm. and things. And there are folk songs on those also. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so when you're, um, for instance, when you were studying the folk music of Rajasthan, yeah. what did you feel were the special features of the music of, of Rajasthan um, which you wanted to absorb into into your music? First of all, I wanted to see the similarity. Hmm. Being a classical musician, every time I heard a tune, I would start comparing it to a classical rag. Every time I heard a particular tal, for instance, seven matras, I would try, I would say, oh, this is something like a rupak tal, it's something like a tivra ra. To Thakur Jaitiya Singh, he said, stop comparing it. Stop comparing it to classical ra. Because I found that when I say seven beats, seven matras, it doesn't have the same emphasis as, as it has in classical music. Hmm. So the points of emphasis in the beats. Emphasis in the beat. Dadra, six matras, hmm. seven matras, sixteen beats, eight kerva, double kerva. But they had their own grammar. That's what the main thing that I found was that Rajasthani music had its own grammar like we have grammar of a classical music, northern classical music. Like we have shlokas in our uh, ragas, you know, mm -hmm. which depicts 
what are the salient features of that particular rag, what is vadi, the main note, what is samvadi, what is vimadi. And uh, same way I found in their form, which is known as jangra. Uh, I don't know how much you have heard some of these Mangyan singers, uh, the Rajasthani uh, singers who are here very regularly in Delhi. Uh, they sing, uh, they have a, they have dohas. We have shloks, they have dohas. Not only that, they have their own ragas. Like we have des and kamaj and todi and uh, Malhars, they have their own low rags, sometimes the same names, but the sarup is different. Like in Rajasthani music, we have Gund Malhar. Yeah, I have a recording of that, if we can play that. Yeah. This is a Doha. Gund Malhar, this is one. to something like this, yeah. I'm interested in knowing, isn't this the kind of formulation by which Hindustani music is also based, where the early part of a recital is without any percussion? Mm-hmm. Alap. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Isn't it that the, what we consider a folk music tradition is actually following a very similar compositional in, strategy? In certain forms, for instance, here uh, I, I sang the Doha, hmm. which is describing the rag, the surup of the rag. 
and uh, so this is Doha, hmm. and there's no accompaniment there. Uh, even in our classical instrumental music, alab, jor, chala, hmm. there's no accompaniment. Hmm. It's just they do the entire vistar of that rag first, and then they come to percussion. Mm-hmm. That is the thing. In in khayal gaiki, uh, for instance. Uh, in certain gharanas, uh, you you begin with a with the composition straight away, like Kirana gharana musicians. Almost just a sa, and then they go on to composition. Mm-hmm. While the Gwalior gharana people take an alap, uh, which depicts the entire structure of the drag, mm-hmm. and Agra gharana. Mm-hmm. Uh, they take the entire dhrupad ang, mm-hmm. nom tom tana na 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 nom tom, and that's quite a long duration. For a long duration, they they do this alap, and then they come to composition, and then alap therein, and then tans. Now, if we come to the tans and mm. the structure and the notes of this particular piece of music, uh, what rag do you feel it fits into? The tans that I took in this. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, Sarang. But it's called Gund Malhar. Gund Malhar. I'm saying the names of these lok rags, as I call them, mm. the names are sometimes the same, mm-hmm. uh, but the swarup is different. Right. So there is a nomenclature difference. Yes. Yes. But the structures are similar sometimes. Sometimes, not always. Like their mand, mm-hmm. their mand is like like we sing tumari, and uh, we the throw of voices there, and uh, and that mand uh, of Rajasthan there's four kinds of mands. The usual mand that perhaps you all have heard is Kesariya Balam. Mm-hmm. Can we um, play the next track? It's a small tapa um, from in Bhairvi. In bad way, okay. Uh, it is a tappa uh, composed by Shori Mia, and this was around the 15th century. Mm, 17th. 17, between 15th mm, yeah, and 17th. Uh-huh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Only my grandson has a right to contradict me. <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's just, it's also that I think what's interesting when you listen to the lyrics of this particular one is that. Um, it's a it's a Sufi rendition, and he's talking about uh, <clears throat> having a vision of the Almighty just once in his life, and then finally he says, "I've been pining for you, birth after birth." Now, in an Islamic context, there is no question of birth after birth, right? There is no question of rebirth, mm-hmm. but this is very interesting how the two traditions um, of Hindu and Islamic are being amalgamated and has become common knowledge. So if you listen to it, it will become quite clear. So you got the bad bit of poison. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
um, these rapid movements, what can you tell us more about it? What's happening there? Why is this called a a tapa? What tapa. makes okay? That is, hmm. yeah. From you're jumping from one note to the other, mm -hmm. and uh, so the tap, 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 hmm. and uh, we also have a tap khayal, in in which the khayal is treated like a tapa in some portions. Mm -hmm. It has tans, it has alap, and everything. But we have tap khayals also. And that uh, really originated in the Gwalior Darbar, Tap Khyal. So this is how these Darbars were, re were assimilating these different kinds of folk yeah. traditions and folk. Yeah. So yeah. when we study, for instance, when I study Ragmala painting, yeah. we have all these iconographies of these different Ragnis, like uh, Bangla Ragni, uh, Malvi Ragni. Mm -hmm. uh, these, I mean, whether Bengal or Malwa or Multani and things like that, I presume these are regional rags or ragnis which have been assimilated into some classical tradition. Very correct. Uh, we have a bangla rag in classical music mm -hmm. which started in a folk form, folk style of uh, rag, tune. Mm -hmm. And it later on came to be known as Bengali, mm -hmm. and then it came into classical music, Bengal. Mm -hmm. Same way, we had Multan, Multani Rag, which originated in Multan, now in West Pakistan. Mm -hmm. It must have been in a folk form and then taken a color cue of, a, of the classical. The rules were and the principles of classical music were applied to it. Were applied to it. And that happened in many. So tell me now, when we look at the music of Eastern UP, for instance, or UP, Bihar, that area. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'd like to mm -hmm. say that uh, Ragmala paintings you were talking about. Mm -hmm. In Ragmala paintings, uh, the, the Doha that is written on the top of the mm -hmm. uh, uh, paintings sometimes doesn't tally with the swarup of our classical music. The name is the same, like Tori, Lalit, uh, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. and. So, the, but the swarup that is written on Ragmala paintings doesn't tally with the swarup of the rag that we sing today. But that is because neither is classical music a static tradition, nor is folk music a static <laughs> tradition. That what might have been classical in 1720, uh, you know, or 1780 in Kishangarh might not be classical in uh, 1820 in Kangra, you know. So, if you're looking at two different Ragmala manuscripts, mm. uh, why should there be consistency each time? After all, with the way you choose to render Rag Hamir and the way Bhatkhande says to render Rag Hamir might be different. Well, of course, rendering it in a di diff different way is one thing, because if you are a creative person, like in Bhatkhande it says, Hamir is Veerras. Hmm. But when I sing, I don't take it as Veerras. I take it as Shringardas. Right. Because I want, when I'm singing, when I'm creating, I want to uh, use the words, the shabd, the bowl, mm. the sahitya mm. of that uh, composition, and then apply my alap and my tans in the, in the same way. Right. This is at least what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the, the Ragmala paintings, maybe at that time, these ragas that we mentioned were folk ragas. Right. It could be that. Right. So And so they don't tell you with our classical ragas. Right. So and now I want to come back to Eastern India. Mm. Uh, what do you think the contribution to the musical traditions of India has been of the region of UP and Bihar and that part? 
to Hindustani music. Today, what we sing as a thumri hmm. or a dadra or a kajri or a chaiti, the light classical forms as they are known in, they are basically folk rags, folk songs. Basically, they are folk songs. And as it happened in the tappa, form of tappa, it happened in, in these forms also. The classical musicians also taking, started taking up these forms at the end of their recital, you know, they ended by a tumri or a kajri, mm -hmm. depending on the, uh, on the rainy season, then it comes kajri, chaiti is something you sing after holi, then holi songs. So it's, uh, uh, we have taken a lot from UP, we have taken a lot from Bihar, um, and the bhasha of those regions, we, we stick to those, that yeah, bhasha. All of the khayal music is also so much of it, it's in Braj and Khadi Boli. Khadi Boli and that bhasha, mm -hmm. yes. In khayals we have also very few, but we have uh, Urdu uh, khayals also, very few. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, khayals uh, in Punjabi also. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how many of you have attended a festival of uh, Punjabi uh, compositions organized by the Punjabi Academy. There are so many khayals in Punjabi. Mm -hmm. Same alap, taan, everything that is done in the other bhashas, other languages. So we have uh, uh, different bhashas in, in, in khayals also. Right. And uh, so these folk forms, and in this, in folk forms, what we have done is knowing Thumari and knowing classical music. Mm -hmm. We bring in, blend in the classical ragas. Like, supposing our Thumari is based on Mr. Khamaj. And what we, to, to bring in new things, different atmosphere, we blend in with different ragas. Mand can come in, Malhar can come in, Jajavanti can come in, provided you come back to the main format of that particular Thumri. Right. So we have the, uh, it makes it very beautiful. But then you've got to, if you're singing a Thumri, you must know your classical uh, ragas very well then alone you can blend in, otherwise you can make a mess of it. So in that case, if we look at folk music traditions, what you're trying to say is that these traditions are as strong and as rigorous mm. as much as classical music they are. They are definitely. Folk music has its own grammar. There's a proper grammar. You can't take liberty with that. Like every time you ask a Jangra singer, Ke goon malar ki aap sunaye, it'll be exactly the same. Right. Exactly the same. The Doha will be the same, which means shlokas of classical music. Right. Same way we have our uh, Doha's shlokas and we have rules of, our, of that particular rag. So every time someone asks, do you please sing Abhogi Kanada, mm -hmm. I'll sing it the same way. Right. The grammar will be the same. Same way the grammar in folk music also is the same. As far as uh, Rajasthani music is concerned, which I have studied and worked on. Is there a question that you want to take? How is the similarity between the classical music and folk music of a particular region try to take place? And for example, Hindustani and Punjabi folk in South India, yeah. mm -hmm. the similarity is between those both and uh, some folk music in South India and Karnataka music. Ah, okay. The themes, the emotions, play a very important part in both music, both music. If in a khayal, classical music, as I said, if the, the, the theme is Nanadiya, Jethaniya or whatever it is, that comes in light classical also. There are lots of dadras in that. There are lots of uh, 
Thubri's uh, in that, noted with that. Uh, in Purya Dana Shri Khal, for instance, what is that Jagat Payal? What is that disorder? Yeah. Payalet, Payalia Ki Jadkar. And you have so many uh, songs on, on Payjev in, 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 in Punjab. You have so many songs on Gaur, on board or necklace, or bangles. So the team, this is the first thing that is there. And uh, of course the language, the first, uh, that is there. So that's why we can easily differentiate. And we have discussed uh, the, the use of notes. Like in a pahari, they are different. Like in, in, a, in a folk song, it's different. And uh, so those, those varieties and those differences we have already, already discussed. But within North India and South India, I think more specifically is what you're trying to establish. Is that it? The, the, is that the, between in Carnatic no music? Well, for the coastal regions, mm -hmm. yeah, they have another flavor. Uh, they are fishermen's songs. Both in the north and in the south, in Bengal also you'll find them, you'll find them in the, in the south also. The theme will be the same. But does the way in which North Indian classical music seems to rely so much and draw on so many different folk traditions of the north, yeah. is there a similar thing that happens in Carnatic music or is that much more, is, is that less able to assimilate? Well, I'm not an expert on Carnatic music, hmm. uh, I must admit that, but certain nuances uh, are bound to be there. Um, and also, nowadays, all kinds of music is in our going in our ears. In the olden days, you stayed with the guru and you heard only your guru, so you imbibed only that. But now, in today's, that's why it's becoming so difficult for us to, uh, to maintain the gharanas, because all sorts of music from different gharanas are going into it. And same way with folk music. So even in the South, Bollywood also, the effect of Bollywood is also there. The use of notes is there. Mm -hmm. They're definitely there. Um, is there another question? The bhajans in every region and all the folk songs, all the regions have their bhajans and that spiritual uh, approach to, uh, to the bhajans and we have a lot of uh, bhajan bowls, shab, in khayal form also and as bhajan per se, that is always there. Different. Like in Rajasthan, there are so many bhajans on Ram, Dev Ji, so many bhajans on so many... But other than bhajan, and... even in the other forms of music, yes. there's constant reference to... Uh, Durga. And Nandala, Nandala and, and, you Sham. Know, and Sham, and those things are, you know, they're ubiquitous. And actually that forms a sort of a cultural uh, binding. commonality, a binding force binding. all over the subcontinent. Yeah. That would be... Yeah. Any more questions? Ma'am, you sung, you were an exponent of, you are still an exponent of both folk music and classical. Uh, what do you think, which of the two forms has given you more freedom to experiment and bring in new ideas? Oh, good question. Both. <laughs> both. You know, in classical music, for instance, I am uh, sticking to the rules of that particular rap. And there's so much improvisation to be done. I'm free, absolutely. And, I, I, and this is what creativity is all about. And same thing in, in folk music. So there's no... I enjoy books. I had cued um, a tumri to end with. Okay, uh, a purab ang tumri. Hmm. Yeah. Um, if you want, we can play that. Right. People want, the students want, we can play a yeah. bit of that. <laughs> hmm? Okay, so let's play that. 
अब के सावन घर आ जा आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द द कॉमन सब्जेक्ट इज द नाइटिंग इज द कौआ इज वॉट एवर दे आर सो मेनी सॉन्ग ले जा संडे सुबह यू नो इन दिस पर्टिकुलर ठुमरी दिस उड़ जा रे द अंतर आई उड़ जा रे कगवा ले जा संडे सुबह मेरे पिया के पास let the bird go and take my message to my lover like huh? yeah <laughs> what did you say you what? never know i mean you never know maybe yeah. <laughs> sandeesh ba mere piya ke paas tere sone se kya bolte hai ha sone se tu chonch ko bada main sone se chonch ko badha dungi main but please do take my message to my lover this is the just the, the, the subject is always very simple and it comes from the heart you know in in any region you'll find this there and this is sung in saman there of <laughs> saman this is the time cycle of 14 weeks